Hello, everyone, and welcome to another great educational webinar we're putting on for you today. Uh, we are happy to have you all here. Thanks for joining. I am joined today with my co-host, Corey Dayharsh. <clears throat> uh, we'll be going over the uh, basics of self-directed IRA investing for you today. If you do have any questions, make sure you do plug those into the chat box as all audio has been muted, but we will be going over those today. Um, and just to type in the questions, we'll get through them throughout the presentation and make sure all questions are answered by the time we wrap this up. Uh, again, my name is Alex Perney. I've been with Advances since about 2012. I've had a lot of experience in account management and actually direct investing of client funds. Uh, so is my colleague, Corey. He uh, did the job for a little bit longer than I did over in operations, so he's also a great wealth of knowledge and a good resource. For uh, any questions you have on the structure of things, even if it is a little bit outside the scope of maybe kind of what we're covering today, or maybe even a little bit more of a in-depth question, feel free to ask those. We encourage questions that helps uh, with other people who may be having the same kind of issues or want similar information. So again, please feel free to ask any questions that you do have. Um, one of us will be more than happy to answer them. All of our direct contact information is up on the screen as well. So do feel free to uh, screenshot that or, um, you know, feel free to reach out to us after this as well for any questions that you may have. To get started, uh, Advanta IRA and our employees, we do not provide investment or tax or legal advice. All information and materials are for educational purposes only, and all parties are encouraged to consult with their attorneys, accountants, and financial advisors before entering into any type of investment. And with that said, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Corey, and he will uh, get into some of the uh, front end and the basics of self-directed IRAs. Yeah, thank you, Alex, for getting us started. So thanks everyone for being here and I appreciate your participation in our webinar today on the basics of self-directed investing. As I get started, I just want to provide a little brief overview of Advanta IRA. We are a self-directed IRA administrator and we serve clients nationwide. We have offices in Florida, Georgia, and I'm up here in Western North Carolina. And we focus on providing clients exceptional customer service, and we have a high level of experience and knowledge in this self-directed industry. So the two things that we really try to do that stand us above others in our industry is provide exceptional customer service and key educational aspects like this webinar you're participating in today that we put out for free. It's something that not a lot of companies in our industry do for free. And we always try to provide a lot of content with a lot of guest speakers that you find interesting and appealing for any retirement investing strategies you may have. A little bit more about us as a company. We've been around for about 20 years. At this point, we've just crossed the threshold of having over 2 billion in assets under management. And all of your funds that are not actively in an investment are insured up to FDIC limits uh, for applicable amounts and limits. And again, we pair each client we have with a dedicated client account manager. Alex has served in that role when he started. I served in that role for about five years processing day-to-day -day client transactions. So you as a client have a one-to-one -one contact with us. You're not calling a back office call center and having to explain your whole scenario and story to a new person each time you reach out. You get one person you're partnered with that learns who you are, what you're trying to do, and helps you in the best way possible for you as the client. Now, what is a self-directed IRA, you may be asking? Well, a self-directed IRA is a retirement account that allows you to make complete control of your retirement funds and investment decisions. You may have a retirement account with a larger wirehouse custodian that they call, quote, self-directed. But really, when you look at the investment options and opportunities they provide, there is a specific limited number of stocks and mutual funds that they've vetted out and have a vested interest or uh, otherwise have already done due diligence on that says they're allowing you to make those investments. With a truly self-directed account, we are not holding any specific rules or regulations above and beyond the IRS's limits for what you can and cannot invest into. So some of the key asset classes that we see are real estate, money lending like private mortgages or unsecured notes, private placements such as syndication deals, precious metals, foreign currency. A lot of people are jumping into the cryptocurrency market with their retirement accounts. And there's many other asset classes. I'll actually go over a few more specifics of asset classes a little bit later in the presentation here. But the next thing I wanted to talk about is why you haven't heard about self-directed IRAs or the self-directed industry in itself. 
So to put into perspective of the $27 trillion retirement account industry, only about 4% of it is currently self-directed. So if this is your first time hearing about it, or you've been implored by a friend or a colleague to check out this webinar, or maybe you just found us on YouTube, you're not alone in this being your first time hearing about it. That's why we put out this education. That's why we do a lot of networking and outreach just to expand people's understanding and knowledge. And even if it might not help you in the moment, maybe in the future, you're ready to start self-directing or you have a friend or a relative that could benefit from self-directed strategies. So specific to today's webinar, I do have a few key takeaway points I'd like everyone to make sure they either take down as a note or walk away with. And the first one is that any IRA or former employer plan can be used to start a self-directed account. So if you have an IRA, whether it's a traditional or a Roth with a larger custodian or one of the wirehouse custodians, you know, the big names that invest your funds into stocks and mutual funds, you can roll a portion or that entire IRA to a self-direct account, as well as any former employer plans like a 401k, a 403b, a 457, a thrift savings plan. If you've left employment and had an employer-sponsored retirement plan, that money's pretty much sitting idle until you choose to do something new with it. So it's a great source of funds to move into a self-direct account. The second takeaway point here is that you choose all of the investments you make and you are responsible for all of the due diligence. So as Alex said in our disclaimer, we do implore you to consult your own CPA, tax preparer, legal advisors. We do have some referrals to that effect that we could provide you if you are needing help in those resources. Uh, but ultimately, it is your responsibility to do that due diligence and be comfortable with the investments you're making. It's not something that falls back on advantage shoulders if uh, your investment doesn't necessarily pan out the way you expected it to. Because again, this is a self-directed investment strategy. And the third takeaway point here is that all expenses and all relative income for your investments generated and outflow directly through the retirement account. So if you're making income from your retirement account investment, that income comes back into your retirement account, not into your bank account or into your pocket until you actually take a distribution from the retirement account. And furthermore, if you have expenses to be paid, like if you're holding real estate and you have to pay for any utilities or things like that, you don't pay that out of your personal pocket, you pay that out of the balance in your retirement account. We'll go into that a little bit further in one of our case studies later on in this webinar. Now, as I alluded to in my first key takeaway point, there are a number of different plans that you can self-direct. It doesn't have to be just a standard traditional IRA. You can also self-direct a Roth IRA. SEP and simple IRAs are, are similarly assessed products that are keyed for certain types of investors and, and account holders. We also have health savings accounts, education savings accounts, and solo 401k plans. If you're a small business owner or have any self-employment income, those types of plans may apply to you. Feel free to reach out to Alex or I if you want to discuss what types of plans appeal to you or even check out our website. We've got a tab that's labeled uh, account types and you can kind of do some research there and find out what may fit your needs and your best case scenario. Now, why do people start choosing to self-direct once they've you know, heard about the options and the resource and the power of self-direction? The three key things that we see people as turning to self-direction are that it's a new source of capital for investors that are already doing some sort of investment and realize they can tap into this cash to further that investment strategy or further those goals. A lot of times you'll see real estate investors realize that they can tap into this money and start doing some additional uh, real estate investing with their IRA or 401k. A lot of people end up fatigued with the stock market. I've had a number of people reach out to us recently uh, and just say, hey, the, the market's just fluctuating too much. I'd like to have a little bit more direct control of the investments I'm making and a little bit more uh, you know, stability in trusting what it's my money's going forward with. And then the ultimate third key point here for why people choose to self-direct is the tax benefit. You'll see in our case studies later, again, I keep referring to those because I want to make sure you stick around for them. The tax benefit of making these investments is that 
the investments grow either on a tax deferred or a tax free basis. So if you've got a tax deferred or a traditional style account, all of your income is generated without having to pay taxes on it until later on when you take distributions of that money. If you've already paid the taxes on your retirement account, meaning you've transitioned it to a Roth account, you can actually make all of your investments and profits grow and never pay taxes on that money that you've created. We'll cover that again a little bit further in our case studies. Now, it is very important that we continue to stress that you must do your own due diligence. And part of that is using your own network. Invest with the people you know so that you're more confident, you're more comfortable. Uh, there's a, a common term in the real estate investing industry, know, like, and trust. Uh, it kind of falls through and true with self-directed investing as well. You wanna make sure you're confident and comfortable that the deals that you plan to make are going to be or have the highest likelihood and chance of successful. Moving money into a self-direct account is a very simple process. Sometimes it doesn't even record any taxable recording or reporting. In those case scenarios, you're moving money via transfer request from like accounts. So basically from a traditional IRA to a traditional IRA, from a Roth IRA to a Roth IRA. The other option is to do a rollover, whether it's a direct or indirect rollover. In that case, there is some taxable reporting, but as long as you're moving the same amount out of a qualified plan into a qualified plan within the allowable time frame that actually cancels each other out from a tax reporting standpoint and you do not have any tax consequence so again there is typically no tax reporting and definitely no tax consequence if you're moving money from a previous plan to a new self-direct account to move forward with self-directed investing now the next few slides i'm going to cover a little bit more detail on what asset classes you can invest into. These are not the only asset classes available. These are just some examples of possibilities. So if you see real estate assets here and one of these bullet points isn't a real estate asset you have in mind, reach out to Alex or I. We'll be happy to talk with you about it and go over specifically how you can make that type of investment. So looking at real estate classes, you can consider single family homes for either a long-term or short-term rentals and even rehab projects if you're a fix and flipper. Condos for the same purposes, long-term, short-term, or rehabbing. Mobile home parks or specific units uh, can be an investment strategy for real estate investors. Tax deed and lien investing if you're just getting started with a self-directed strategy or, or a retirement account balance and you've only got a few thousand dollars. Tax deed and lien investing is a great strategy that people use to get in the door. We've had some great webinars with great experts on how to do tax deed and lien investing. I implore you to check that out on our YouTube channel if you have not done so already. Real estate investment trusts are a different way to structure your real estate investments. I believe we've covered that as well on some of our other content and you can find that as well. And then syndication or private placement investments. That's not necessarily holding real estate in your retirement account, but it is a means to enjoying a real estate investment syndication with your retirement funds, meaning you basically are a limited partner and you basically receive proceeds from the investment you've made just by letting your cash sit in that syndication for a certain uh, time period. I'll actually be covering that in one of my case studies later as well. So I referenced earlier mortgage loans and private loans, whether it's a secured or unsecured note, paper assets are a, a lot of different strategies that our clients utilize as far as loaning either to uh, someone that's looking to buy a property and, and can't get a conventional mortgage, uh, someone that you know that's a trusted friend or non-disqualified relative that needs a note uh, that you're willing to lend and have an agreement with them. And other outside notes like option contracts, if you're trying to get started in the real estate industry, uh, you could actually do an option contract and, and sell the option to buy a piece of property. Uh, you can do assignments and joint ventures. There are a lot of different classes of paper assets that you can get into. It's really just, again, holding paper in the name of your retirement account to make an investment decision and hopefully grow a, a good amount of wealth in that product. Now, some other unique investments we've seen are setting up LLCs or structuring LLCs for partnerships. Uh, we've seen clients invest into movie projects, uh, farm animals, 
for either breeding rights or actual farm uh, capacity and selling for the meat and livestock, uh, Forex accounts, private stocks, commodities, oils and gas. There's a number of alternative assets, even furthermore than just alternative investing that you could check out. Uh, my colleague Larissa and I did a webinar on the most unique investments we've seen a few months back. So if you're looking for really out of the box strategies, feel free to check out that webinar as well, or reach out to Alex or I, we'd be happy to talk to you about what your unique strategy is and how it could fit into a self-directed investing strategy. Now with that, I'm gonna turn over to Alex here. He's gonna go over some of the rules and regulations about self-directed investing. And once he wraps that up, we'll get into those case studies I've been referencing for a few slides now. All right, thanks, Corey. Yeah, so like Corey said, uh, I'll be getting into uh, rules and regulations, kind of the uh, nuts and bolts that uh, everyone uh, needs to know about. You know, it's not always, uh, you know, what people want to hear about, but it's important to understand kind of where the limitations on this stuff exist. So that way you can make informed decisions and also understand what you're getting yourself into. So as Corey said, there's a lot of different stuff you can invest in. It's not just kind of one focus track like you would see at a large brokerage where it's only stocks and mutual funds. We do offer full uh, <clears throat> discretion on the clients as to what they want to invest in with some limitations. So mainly those are going to be based on kind of two different buckets. One is certain types of investments you cannot deal with and certain people you cannot deal with as well. So kind of those two things combined are what make up the majority of the rules related to self-directed investments. So those are called prohibited investments and prohibited um, uh, individuals. So prohibited investments are going to be a life insurance uh, contract. You can't hold a term life insurance policy in an IRA. Uh, it's you know just a straight rule. The other one that's a little bit more nuanced though is things that derive their value from collectability. So think of things like antiques, uh, rare bottles of wine, uh, baseball cards, uh, Pokemon cards, things like that are not going to be things that you can hold in an IRA. Now, certain types of coins are allowable. So things that are traded not on their numismatic value, but on their bullion content value specifically are allowable. So thing, think things like um, uh, gold American eagles, uh, Canadian gold maple leaves, silver coins, uh, platinum and palladium coins issued by large governmental organizations such as the United States, Canada, Mexico, uh, China, Australia, Great Britain, things like that are allowable to be invested with the IRA. So in general, precious metals are allowable. You can certainly buy them in coin format, but you're not gonna be buying something that's uh, you know, valued on its rarity past just the fact that it is made with a precious metal. So those are some things to consider. If you're looking at especially precious metals, not a lot of people, you know, are thinking about buying, uh, you know, artwork with their IRAs or collectibles, but it is something good to know, especially if you want to understand the comprehensive rule structure with regard to IRAs. Now, prohibited transactions are not just the act of investing in uh, in a prohibited asset class, but also in, also investing with disallowable people, so prohibited individuals. So I'll get into a infographic on the next slide that has to do specifically with whom you cannot directly deal with, but it's important to understand that there are people you cannot deal with um, directly with your IRA. Now, there are opportunities to potentially partner with these types of people um, on, you know, essentially the the scenario I pose is that it's okay to be on the same side of the, of the closing mm -hmm. table with a prohibited individual, meaning that you're partnering or doing a deal together, but you can't sit on opposite sides of the table and transact with each other, buy and sell to each other. And keep in mind, you are considered a disqualified individual from your IRA directly, meaning that if you own something personally, and this has a lot to do with real estate, we get a lot of real estate investors, you know, I'd say probably solidly 70% or 60, 65 to 70% of our AUM is going to be real estate related. So a lot of people come into this already having invested in real estate. If you own something like a rental property or you own a note, you cannot sell that to your IRA, even if it's at an appraised or certified market value, it has to be all done at arm's length. So you can't self deal to your IRA and you also can't deal with these disqualified individuals, which I'll get into in a moment. If you want to do some more reading, again, uh, I wouldn't always consider the IRS publications light reading, end quote, but uh, if you want to read through the actual um, legislative, or I should say the, the code packet on that, it is uh, Internal Revenue Code 4975. If you go to irs.gov, you can find it pretty easily by just typing in that, um, 
publication number. It's not too hard to get through, but it does, you know, clearly lay out their stance on prohibited investments and prohibited individual transactions. Another thing to consider, though, is depending on what you want to invest in, because and we'll get into one of the case studies about investing in entities, is considerations for some rather uh, exotic taxes that can be associated with certain types of investments. If your IRA is going to, if you want to invest your IRA into an active position in a trade or business, uh, think about your IRA buying an LLC, which you can certainly buy LLC membership with your IRA. If your IRA is going to purchase LLC membership and that LLC, let's say, operates a, uh, a dry cleaner or a coin laundry or a, a gas station, just some active trade or business, uh, the IRA, the IRS will levy a tax called UBIT or unrelated business income tax, which would require your IRA to file a tax return. Now, this isn't the presentation to get into, you know, the nuts and bolts of all this, but it's just kind of an important high level thing to understand that if you invest in an active trader business, there is an additional tax that's levied. This not, and there is some distinction between investing into a passive position or something that, you know, is just used for structuring purposes like an LLC to buy one piece of rental property, not considered an active trader business. To further compound that issue, though, uh, the IRS in their uh, infinite detail are rather vague on what constitutes an active trader business. But it's one of those things where if you have a question about it, ask. The other part about this, again, with most of our AUM being real estate related is debt. If your IRA finances the prop purchase, purchase of a property or a larger project has debt associated with it, there might be another further tax that is applied called unrelated debt finance income tax, which more often than not gets kind of lumped in with UBIT. The important thing to understand is that if you use an IRA and you want to finance a property purchase, there's an additional tax return that needs to be filed. Now, it's not the most complicated thing in the world. We can certainly help you through it. But a good note, especially if you are a self-employed individual and you want to invest in real estate with debt, if you can use a 401k to effectuate that purchase, you are exempted from that debt finance income tax. Now, again, don't want to get too far down the rabbit hole. I know I've probably spent a little bit more time than need be on that specific um, regulatory issue with UBIT and UDFI. But again, it's good to understand. We want to give people a good baseline so they can kind of clearly maybe start to formulate their, their um, strategies when it comes to investing uh, in self-directed type assets. Hey Alex, before we move on to the next slide, there is a few questions that specifically relate to prohibited investments. I, I wanted to see if you wanted to address real quick. So it, it's kind of a, a twofold here. Uh, someone posted, I recently heard that there's a way to utilize self-directed IRA funds in combination with whole life insurance and both can be tax-free and rolled back into the IRA. Have you heard of anything about this opportunity or allowance? And then furthermore, they noted, I did hear you say no to term life insurance. What about whole life insurance? Uh, that's something I, I've only recently been informed or aware that's an allowable investment with the 401k model, not necessarily with the IRA, but I, I know you typically have a, a little bit uh, better grasp on the pulse of things like that. Is that something you have any insight for as well? Yeah, ultimately, when it comes to insurance products, the kind of the easy one is term life. Um, that is just, you know, you know, line item disallowable. But you do have large insurance houses that do have qualifying insurance products that can be purchased with an IRA. Um, they are, they're just not, it's kind of like buying REITs with an IRA. Yeah, you can do it. It's not necessarily the most popular of investments. Um, but the, at the end of the day, um, and similar to what I tell people with uh, health savings plans and making sure that you're, you qualify for a health savings account is to ask the underwriter for that contract if it qualifies for IRA investment. They'll know and they'll be able to tell you because, you know, they, they're the ones that are selling the investment and would be able to or need to be able to accurately answer that 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 question. There are some additional allowances for different insurance products with 401k. Corey is definitely on the money with that. With regard to IRAs, the scope of the insurance product availability is much narrower and you would ultimately need to, to ask the issuer of that contract um, if it qualifies for IRA direct investment. Um, it's just there, there's so many small nuanced things that in all honesty, I am not super uh, uh, you know, I, I don't have enough information to kind of accurately answer specific on a 
type of contract, but I know enough to say that um, there are some allowances and you ultimately need to kind of push that question back onto the contract issuer uh, to see if an IRA could invest in it. Um, so the answer is, is maybe, but you would ultimately need to get some more information from the person selling that uh, product. All right, perfect. Thank you, Alex. And while you're transitioning slides, I just want to uh, take a second to remind everyone, please post your questions in the chat box or in the question box more directly. Uh, we will address those if they relate to our slides. And if not, we'll address them in the end of the webinar. We've got a specific point where we're going to address any uh, unrelated necessary questions uh, to make sure your questions are heard, answered, and addressed. Thank you. All right, sounds good. So when I mentioned, I mentioned that there are people you cannot deal with. So the easy way of thinking about this is look at your family tree like I have illustrated up here. Look directly up and down from it at yourself and your spouse. These are people you cannot directly buy and sell things to. And on the next slide, I'll kind of get into some of the more nuanced ways that you can actually get into a prohibited transaction as well. So the people you cannot directly deal with or have IRA assets utilized by are mother, father, son, daughter, spouse, yourself personally, um, anyone directly uh, in that uh, family, familial nuclear family of yours. Now, business entities owned or controlled by one of the above are equally disqualified as well. So that's important to understand that just because something is an entity, not directly the individual personally can still cause a prohibited transaction to be committed. Now, you, if you're looking at this, you're probably well aware that Things like siblings, aunts and uncles, cousins are not listed there. Those are because those are not disqualified individuals. If you have a, let's say, a, a, uh, a cousin or an uncle that's a real estate investor and you want to buy some properties or, in, or you know, directly deal with them on a transactional basis, you can definitely do that. Uh, you need to make sure that you are dealing with them on a fair market value basis. So if you're going to deal with a family member that's once removed outside of this uh, chain of issue, then just make sure that you're not getting some type of, you know, super discount. You know, if the property's worth 100 grand and they sell it to you for 20, that could cause an issue because of your personal relationship to them. You know, you don't necessarily have to get like certified appraisals or third party evaluations done of assets. It's this kind of stuff is done on good faith. Just keep in mind is that, you know, if you wanted to sit in front of the IRS and have to explain it, would you feel comfortable in saying that, you know, you didn't get some type of undue treatment because of your familial relationship to some of these people? Now, if you find a killer deal out in the open market, yeah, not necessarily as much of an issue, but just keep in mind, if you are going to deal with family, one, you know, dealing with family and investments can, you know, if investments go bad, it can make for a very awkward Thanksgiving dinner. But besides that, you know, it's also something that you have to be cognizant of in the fact that, if you are dealing with family members, the IRS can be more, uh, can scrutinize it a little bit more if you weren't just dealing out in the open market. Not to say that these, these kind of transactions on a micro level are reported to the IRS. The reporting that we do for the IRA accounts, the IRS does not get like a ledger list of trades, purchases, sales, uh, whom you're dealing with. They get very minimal information about what actually goes on within the IRA. And that's true of self-directed IRAs and larger custodians that are dealing in brokerages. If you have a brokerage account at you know some large brokerage, let's say Fidelity, the IRS, if you made 100 trades through the year, is not getting a list of all the trades you made or anything that you purchased. They're simply just getting a report of value. Same thing holds true with the, uh, the self-directed IRA. If you bought and sold a few properties, issued a few notes, maybe bought some private stock, the IRS is not going to know necessarily that your IRA did all these actions. They just get a report of value. So um, just keep in mind that you know this kind of stuff is not reported. Take that for what it's worth and you know go forward and be careful accordingly. So prohibited transactions, what do they look like? Because it's important to understand kind of how these things can crop up. So your IRA purchases a piece of real estate from your son. Easy enough. You cannot directly purchase and sell. But a little bit more of a nuanced one is that utilization of the IRA owned asset by a disqualified individual is prohibitive as well. Uh, the example here is an IRA owns real estate and leases it out to your daughter. The, here's an exact example I had when I was doing account management for clients. Had a client that came in, he wanted to buy a piece of property in Auburn, Alabama. What's in Auburn, Alabama? University of, Al University of Auburn. So went through the closing, everything went smoothly. Uh, he was the intention to rent it out to college students. So he provided a lease and there were four women listed on the lease and one of them had the same last name as him. So I asked that, hey, you know, 
who is this you know person with the same last name and he goes oh it's my daughter you know we're she's paying rent she's got a job and everything well even though she was paying rent at a market value it was still disqualified because she is a prohibited individual to him to deal with a ira owned asset and that can be utilization as far as renting also things like working on the property so if your ira purchased real estate and hires your son or his company to perform rehab work if he's a gc or a landscaper, a plumber, electrician, X, Y, or Z, then that could also be prohibitive as well. So you need to really treat your IRA owned assets as completely arm's length. Uh, I tell people, you know, treat your IRA owned property or assets, you know, even if it's just down the road or in your local area, as if it was on the other side of the country from you, you know, make sure that you are dealing with this stuff in a complete arm's length uh, transactional basis with regard to people who do the work and utilize the property. And you'll typically not run afoul of about 90% of the issues that people typically run into. It's just making sure that you really drill down on this being arm's length and not dealing with anyone in your direct family or yourself personally, you'll probably be fine. But past that, and again, getting a little bit into a little bit more nuance, um, your father IRA lending money to your son, so skipping a generation is disqual disqualifying. Let's say your IRA makes a down payment on a property. You're going to finance the property purchase. You cannot personally guarantee or personally extend credit worthiness to that deal for it to be made. It has to be fully non-recourse, meaning that the lender can only come after the property and you're not guaranteeing the remainder of the balance of that mortgage in the event of default. Now, let's say your spouse's IRA owns a piece of real estate and wants to sell your IRA a portion of that property. Well, that would be disqualifying as well. Now, remember I said you can't be on the same side of the closing table um, from each other, but you could partner. So in that scenario where your spouse's IRA buys a piece of real estate and you want to have your IRA involved in the deal as well, you could treat that as a partnership where both IRAs come together in uh, on the same side of the closing table and either with a LLC or a trust or what's with with what's called joint tenants in common, jointly purchase a, um, a piece of real estate. And this can also be drilled down into things like uh, uh, other alternative assets or other types of asset classes. Just understanding that if you want to have two IRAs of family members of those disqualifying family members involved, they have to be done as partnerships, not as, you know, okay, well, let's just use one IRA now and buy it, and then I'll just sell you a portion or assign a portion later can't do that. It has to be done from the onset. And uh, those percentages always have to be, remain locked in for the life cycle of the asset if you're doing a partnership. So it's good to understand how the prohibited transactions kind of work in um, to that scenario. Now, again, we are focusing mainly on real estate because that's the large portion of why most people are here, why a large portion of the people choose to self-direct. So I wanted to kind of get into a little bit more of the detail with that because real estate, unlike almost any other type of asset, uh, that we do administer has a lot of things that go into it past just closing on it. You buy a piece of real estate. It's not like buying a piece of stock for a, or a share of stock where it's okay. You own it and you just either sit back and hold it for appreciation gain or hold it for dividends or distributions. Real estate has a lot of stuff that goes into it after you actually purchase it. So it's under, important to understand one, how you close real estate in an IRA because it's not just as simple uh, as buying anything else. It's not a packet of gum or a share of stock. There's a lot of things that go into that. So the things to remember when it comes to buying real estate in an IRA is that everything has to be titled in the name of the IRA, from the contract to the settlement statement, deeds, estoppels, prorations, title policies. All this stuff has to be in the name of the IRA and also has to be signed on behalf of the IRA by the administrator or custodian, in this case, Advanta. So from the very beginning, the thing that people run into a lot is that they open up an IRA, they'll sign a contract personally. I know, Corey, this probably drove you up a wall. I know it did me too. Um, and it's not necessarily the fault of the client. It's just, again, this is why we try to do a lot of education is that we would get a contract a few days before closing in the client's name personally. All the closing docs and doc prep have been done uh, in the client's name personally. And then everything has to be redone, re-signed in the name of the IRA correctly. So if everything's done correctly from the beginning, causes a lot less headache. So it's important to understand that in general, whenever you're buying anything with an IRA, it has to be in the name of the IRA. But it's doubly important with real estate that because there's so much, it's, it's such a paperwork intensive process with so many different things going into it, that it's kind of done right from the beginning. So Advanta IRA for benefit of John Smith IRA is how the contract would be written and any other closing documents for that matter. Uh, purchases can be made with yourself and others and all of the income. So rents, the equity of the sale, 
distributions, anything like that, all go directly back into the IRA that has made the purchase. So that kind of covers the front end. Now, ongoing with especially real estate and to an extent other assets as well, you're going to have expenses that need to be paid. So let's think real estate. So you have at minimum, you're going to have property taxes that have to be paid on an annual basis, because even though this is a tax sheltered account, you're not um, protected from having to pay real estate taxes. The, the property tax bill has to be paid. Now, obviously, rents and uh, the, the, the sale proceeds from selling real estate, that's all non-taxable, but real estate taxes are outside of that scope, so you have to pay those. So we would need to make sure that any expenses are paid directly from the IRA funds. So the another thing that you need to remember about prohibited transactions is that you cannot float an expense from your IRA personally. So if there's a property tax bill, you need to make sure that's paid from by the IRA. Now, if you buy the property directly with the IRA here, we make sure that we get pre-authorization to pay things like property ins property insurance, uh, uh, property taxes. Uh, you can certainly have a third party property manager that's going to take care of all those and then just bill the IRA if you want to. Now, you're gonna have to pay those kind of people a vague of probably about 10% of net rents or gross rents in order to provide that service. Granted, you know, what's the time value of money to you? Does it make your life easier? Is it worth that 10% of gross rents? Well, you know, there certainly may be a value to that. You don't have to use a third party property manager. <clears throat> we do allow you to self-administer the property. Uh, now, what that means is that you can't do any of the work. You can certainly go inspect the work after it's been done. You can have rent checks mailed to you, made payable to the IRA. You're not depositing it and sending it back to the IRA. So you can, you know, kind of do management light. You know, you can't act as a formal property manager to the property, but you can certainly coordinate everything that has to go into that without running into much of an issue. But you certainly are allowed to have a third-party property manager if you'd like to. We're certainly help that, happy to help facilitate that for clients. But just understand, uh, some people think that you have to have a third-party property manager, especially for real estate. That's definitely not the case. But there's some additional considerations to give to make sure you're not crossing any of those prohibited um, uh, transaction or, or, or lines that we kind of went over earlier. Now, again, managing the property, who can't do the work, who can Going back to that slide of the family tree, those are the people that cannot do the work. They can't provide any type of service for the property, uh, painting, mowing grass, replacing a water heater. Any repairs cannot be done by a disqualified individual. That includes yourself. A lot of people, when they get into investing in real estate, for the most part, like to be, you know, tend to be a little bit handy people. Not necessarily true for everyone. I'm not making that as a blanket statement, but something simple, you know, painting a wall, uh, you know, replacing a light fixture. A uh, faucet, things like that. While the IRS certainly is not, you know, micro auditing IRAs, it's important to understand that you're dealing with, you know, your retirement fund. You're dealing with a fantastic, a fantastic vessel for tax exemption that, if you mess it up, can essentially blow the whole thing up. And you know, the risk versus reward of, you know, maybe paying an additional fifty dollars to have someone else do that job versus, you know, saving those few bucks on the front end, I think is well worth the, you know, additional. Uh, overhead to have someone else that's non disqualified do those work is a little bit more cumbersome and annoying. Certainly, you know, me personally, uh, you know, having to pay a painter or a handyman to come out and touch up some paint and, uh, you know, replace some baseboards to get a property rented definitely a headache. But again, the risk versus reward of running afoul of the IRS. I think that extra money is is very well spent and you know essentially cheap insurance. Now, who can do the work? Again, any non-disqualified person. Uh, the IRA owner can certainly inspect the work, so you can go walk through the property and make sure that Jane, the handy woman, actually replaced the baseboards or actually painted the walls and replaced some sconces. You know, you, it's not like you have to just take people's word for it, but you can't do the work yourself. And furthermore, to that, we don't necessarily require that IRA owners only use. Um, uh, licensed contractors. Now, granted, there's definitely a benefit to using someone that's licensed and insured and qualified to do the work. I would always encourage people to make sure you're getting people qualified to do the work because of you know any number of issues that can arise from that. But we're not going to vet and make sure that this person holds proper licenses to do whatever you need to have done with the property. You just need to make sure that they are non-disqualified uh, so far as the IRS rules go to do it. But again, we don't necessarily have like a preferred vendors list or a requirement of uh, showing insurance and licenses and things like that. So take that for what it's worth and you know choose your uh, repair people or service providers accordingly. Now, renting property. 
Most of the time, clients, especially with IRAs, are buying for cash flow. So rental is a very uh, common type of income that we see. So who rents out the property? You as the IRA owner get to write all your criteria for how you want to have the property rented from how you want to qualify your tenants to what you want to set the rental rates at. Everything like that is, is determined by you. Now, there does need to be a, a lease in place. You know, the IRA would need to be the one signing the lease or if you had a property manager engaged with a, with a contract between the IRA and the property manager, some type of limited power of attorney can be sent there for the property manager to execute that lease. But we're not gonna be the one telling you that your rents are too high or too low. You're the one that gets to choose all of those kind of uh, factors when it comes to how you're actually going to have the property or the investment utilized uh, within that account. Again, the IRA, the IRA negotiate, IRA owner negotiates all the terms of the lease. Uh, you would be named as the point of contact for any issues that the tenant has if you're not using a property manager. Again, we're not property management, so if you give them the contact number for Advanta and it's after five, you know they're getting a voicemail. So it's important to understand, you know, contact information and stuff is important on there, especially if you're renting something. Uh, is that we're just the administrator, we're not a property manager. Uh, to do that. And again, you can certainly have third-party property management, but you do not have to, and you are not required to do so. So with that said, we're getting into the case studies. Corey's going to take over the first two, and I'm going to round it out with the last two. So Corey, do you want to take it from here? Yep. Thank you very much, Alex. And I'm starting with case study one here, how to purchase rental real estate within your retirement account. So it's going to be a brief overview of just the process from start to finish for a new client setting up with Advanta. So we've got John here who's got a former employer 401k and he wants to purchase a rental property down the street from his personal residence. So John basically sets up a self-direct account with Advanta. Our application process is a seven page application, takes you about 15 minutes to complete. We usually get the account opened, funds transferred in and ready to fund your investment transaction within about seven to 10 days, uh, business days. So it's a pretty quick turnaround process if you're looking to get started and really have a deal you wanna close within about a month or so, that's definitely a reasonable, comfortable time frame. Uh, so John has already found the investment property, he's opened the account, gotten it funded with a rollover from his previous employer 401k, he submits an offer to purchase the property in the name of his retirement account, as Alex alluded to earlier in his slides. And then he submits to Advanta a purchase authorization form and marks all of the closing paperwork as read and approved so that Advanta as the account administrator can execute on the name of the retirement account making this investment transaction. That process, as Alex mentioned, uh, sometimes comes to us at the 11th hour, in, in, in all honesty, with real estate transactions. What we try to do to, to help circumvent those last minute issues, anytime a client lets us know they have a transaction coming underway, we send out an instruction email for exactly what they need to know and provide us to make it a smooth investment transaction. So on Advanta IRA's end, we work directly with the closing agent, title company, whoever it may be on the other side of the deal to make sure this is smooth and simple. Once we collect John's read and approval of all the paperwork, we sign all the documents on behalf of the IRA, wire the funds out to closing to be held in escrow if we're a little bit ahead of time on things. And then we we ultimately receive and hold the executed and recorded deed and copy of all documents. And then we receive all income and pay all expenses directly from the IRA account. Our clients actually have the ability to log into an online portal and submit bill payment requests. So that can actually be done 24 seven. It doesn't necessarily need to be an email or a phone call within the standard operating hours of 8.30 to 5 p.m. Eastern time. You can always log into your online portal and submit a bill payment request as well. And you'll get email notifications when any income or outgoing funds uh, travel through your account. So in this case study, the property that John purchased was rented out at $1,200 a month for two years. And then John decided to sell the property after two years for $170,000, uh, which in context of the uh, undocumented here, original purchase price was a profit of $50,000. So you take that $50,000 profit plus the $28,000 in rental income, there are no taxes paid at that point in time on the $78,000 of profit that John realized. So now at the turn, he has 
in his IRA account, whether it's a tax deferred traditional account or a post tax Roth account to go ahead and invest into his next deal. That may even be enough to do two properties with that amount of money uh, and two separate deals moving forward. But nonetheless, it's a self-directed account and John has the option to do what he wants with it. Case study number two is investing into a syndication. So again, this may be a larger real estate deal where you're not necessarily taking the ownership of the property, but you're investing as a limited partner, putting your money forth and letting the general partnership of that syndication do the day-to-day the -day work and return you some dividends from the investment they've made. So in this scenario, I've also got John as the investor. He has over 100,000 in an IRA at a larger custodian, Merrill Lynch in this example. John connects with investor Jane, who has put together a private offering. So she is a general partner in this case uh, to purchase and upgrade a local distressed apartment building. Jane provides John with all the subscription documents and the prospectus so he can do his due diligence. And after he reviews it all and consults his appropriate professionals, he decides he wants to move forward and invest. So John opens a self-direct account with Advanta. Again, that process only takes about 15 minutes. He completes a transfer request form to have Merrill Lynch move the funds to his Advanta account. We typically receive that, fax it over, and we receive the funds within typically five business days, seven business days on, on average for a transfer request. And then Advanta submits uh, and notifies John when the funds arrive, again, either via a phone call from the account manager or a direct email notification he would receive on the date that the funds hit the account. From there, the investment subscription paperwork that I referenced on the last slide uh, should be turned over to the account manager, uh, making sure that the name of the investor is not John personally, but his Advanta account, so Advanta IRA for the benefit of John Jones with his account number. The tax ID number for this investor will be the trust tax ID for Advanta IRA, not the investor's tax ID or social security number as an individual. That is a key distinction so that John does not receive any tax consequence or implications for making this investment with his retirement account. And the way this investment pans out in this scenario, moving forward, Jane pays an 8% preferred distribution to all subscribers. So that's $8,000 a year to John's IRA each year. And then in the fifth year, the project is refinanced and John also receives a lump sum payout of $130,000 as the final payout to close out the deal that's run full cycle. So in this scenario, John's IRA earned $40,000 in yearly preferred distributions, plus a $30,000 profit at the end of the deal, as well as the return of his initial $100,000 investment. So he has generated $70,000 of, again, either tax deferred or completely tax free income by having his money held in this syndication for a five year period. That wraps up my two case studies. I'm gonna pass it over to Alex on partnering for a real estate investment transaction. Yeah, thanks Corey. So in this scenario, remember how I said that, you know, if you wanna invest with a disqualified individual, it needs to be done as a partnership. Now these uh, case studies aren't necessarily, uh, you know, staked on the fact that these people are disqualified, but this is how you would do it. You know, you can, you know, supplement or exchange these people and it kind of works the same. So in this case, Paul and Linda wanna partner on real estate. They each have 100 grand in their IRAs and they find a property for 150 that will need 20,000 in repairs to get it rent ready. So neither one of them alone have enough money to take down the property, but together they have 200. And if the property all said and done is a is 170, then they certainly can uh, can take this down. And they estimate receiving $15, $1,500 per month in rent, which will go directly into their IRAs tax free. So now, what does this look like structurally? How does this kind of move going forward? Okay, so who does what? In this case, just like with Corey's case studies, the clients, Paul and Linda, need to open the accounts. They need to find the investment property. They make the offer to purchase and submit all the relevant documents to Advanta. Now, what we do is we work with the closing agents, the uh, sellers, the buyer's agent, the uh, title agent, the or the real estate attorney in this case, if there was one, uh, to get everything properly done and titled within the names of the respective IRAs. Now, in this case, it's going to be a tenant in common, so a TIC purchase, 
where both IRAs are going to be named on the deed directly. So Advanta IRA for benefit of Paul IRA as to a 50% undivided interest and Advanta IRA for benefit of Linda IRA as to a 50% undivided interest. And I'll get into uh, the next case study of how you could maybe simplify this a little bit. But in this case, they're just partnering directly on the deed. They're going to be partnered. They're going to be listed as exactly that on contract settlement statements. Everything going up to this is going to be in the name of both IRAs. And we'll convey that and make sure the instructions are properly provided to everyone that needs to get them. We sign everything on behalf of the IRAs and then the wire the 150 to closing. So we wire the 75 grand from each account to the closing agent and everything is buttoned up. Then we receive and store all the copies of the closing documents, original deeds, original title policies, all that kind of stuff, and then deposit rents and pay any expenses uh, respectively from both accounts. So this is how the tenants and common titling looks. So if you wanted to grab a screenshot, here's the slide to do it on. And the percentages, is ba are, the percentages are based on the amount contributed from each IRA, no more, no less. So if Paul was to contribute less money than Linda, it wouldn't be 50-50. It would be based on exactly the amount of capital each one provided into the deal. And this is doubly true when it comes to investing with disqualified individuals. So if Paul and Linda were uh, husband and wife, or if Paul was Linda's son, or if Linda was... Um, or I'm getting a little mixed up, but you kind, of, you kind of get the picture. If they were disqualified individuals, you could do this deal exactly like this, but it has to, again, be based exactly on the amount of percentage of capital contributed into the deal. So um, I keep that in mind. Now, percentages can change if it's a non-disqualified individual that you are dealing with. But if you are just dealing with a disqualified individual, those percentages can never change. So having enough money in each account to pay for their respective portion of any and all expenses going forward is very important. So let's say Paul had barely enough money to cover his portion of closing and Linda had more money than, than he did in the account and her account. Then if let's say a new roof came up, then Paul would need to have enough money in his account to cover half of that roof repair cost. So you can kind of see where you need to do a little bit of planning just because you have enough money to close doesn't mean that the percentages necessarily should be drawn along the lines of initial thought. You need to kind of give a little bit more examination to exactly how this is going to play out in the future with regard to ongoing expenses. Now, partnerships kind of kind of take one of two routes when it comes to IRAs. People either use the IRAs directly as tenants and commons on a deed, or they'll use uh, something called a checkbook control IRA or checkbook control LLC. Now, this isn't specifically referencing a partnership, but it's easy to kind of extrapolate this from the basis of how this kind of thing works. So checkbook control refers to the client having tighter control of the funds in the IRA by virtue of being named as the manager of an IRA owned LLC. So in this scenario, the way it works, instead of the IRA to the IRA buying the asset directly. So let's just say that Joe is looking to buy, you know, a, a piece of real estate, the IRA, instead of going to closing, would be focused on funding a newly formed LLC. Now, this LLC can't be one that you've opened up personally or signed into the IRA, because remember those disqualifying um, transaction rules, has to be done from the standpoint of a newly formed LLC for the specific purpose of having the IRA own it. So in this case, again, all these things start from the same exact footing. Joe needs to complete the IRA application and facilitate his rollover from his existing IRA or 401k, which we certainly help out with. Now, Joe gets to choose what state he's going to set up the LLC. He's going to choose the name for the LLC. Uh, he's going to have someone draft an operating agreement and file the articles of that LLC for him. And then just like as in with any real estate purchase, the IRA in this case is named as the 100% member shareholder of the LLC with Joe being named as the manager. So it's not, it, it has to be an, a, a member, a single member manager managed LLC. It can't be a member managed LLC. And from here, you could see how you could add in multiple members to this. So the IRA could have other taxable or other IRA members, and you would just define the membership percentages based on how much capital everyone contributed in. And then instead of having to chop up the title of a deed with a bunch of different owners, just the one LLC can purchase the real estate, and then all of the members as a pooled kind of omnibus uh, accounting can then just use the LLC to collect rents and pay bills. And it makes things a little bit easier from a partnering perspective to do it on an LLC route than maybe doing it directly on the deed. Now, 
we have to sign the operating agreement in this case, and then Advanta issues the check to fund the LLC. Now, Joe in this case has opened up the account in the name of the bank account in the name of the LLC, and then from there, the LLC is what engages on contracts, deeds, settlement statements. The name of the LLC is what goes on all those documents, and then the LLC funds the purchase, and the LLC owns the property. The IRA owns the LLC, so kind of the layering effect of the IRA owns the LLC, the LLC owns the real estate. So the IRA effectually owns real estate, but in a very technical sense, the IRA owns 100% of the membership in a newly formed LLC. And then from there, Joe, as the manager of the LLC, can write checks to pay for any and all expenses, uh, coordinate the funds a little bit tighter than he would at Advanta since we're not directly issuing payment for everything. So these kind of scenarios work really well. Again, if you want to have a lot of partners on a deal, if you want to maybe do something that's a very rehab intensive project where you need to write a lot of checks and actually hand payment same day, something is being done. If you want to do things like auctions, all these kind of things can certainly, certainly in some circumstances be facilitated or helped by having a checkbook control uh, IRA or checkbook control LLC. Now, again, the IRA owns 100% of the LLC membership. Checkbook controls allows the manager, manager IRA owner to write checks directly to fund investments, pay bills, et cetera. Now, this definitely is a little bit more on the, more of the bespoke use of IRAs. It's not necessarily as common. It's definitely a very popular method, but certainly the lion's share of our clients actually just invest in real estate directly. Now, this definitely has case study um, and, and legal precedent to be an allowable type of investment. Two of the primary cases that uh, kind of established this as a viable investment method are listed up here with the Swanson v. Commissioner case of 1996 and the TL the Ellis Tax Court Memo of 2013. Uh, more recently, there was a case, um, the U.S. v. McNulty, that also came out, which is not listed up here, which dealt with um, direct personal access to IRA-owned assets, and the clients actually lost the case, but it primarily dealt with people self-storing metals at home, not necessarily the structure of the IRA-owned LLC per se, but it's important to understand that you need to stay up with, you know, if you're going to be doing something like this where it's a structured investment, do your research, make sure it's a good fit for you, because there are potential issues that could um, crop up from time to time. With that said, uh, that's pretty much all that we have for you today. Uh, if you want to, if you're interested in getting started, you can certainly uh, contact uh, Corey or myself. We are more than happy to help you with the account opening process and investing. It's a fairly straightforward process, but we are always happy to be resources and help for you. I'll leave our contact information up there. And Corey, are there any questions that have cropped up since uh, I took over? Yeah, there are actually uh, a few questions. <clears throat> excuse me, that we can address here. The first one I see looks like our siblings, not disqualified persons. That is something that we did cover. Yes, um, siblings are not disqualified persons. Those are allowed to be um, deal dealt with from an investment standpoint. I have seen clients do private lending to their siblings. Other types of investments are allowed as well. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, you can I definitely clear my throat. I, I apologize for that, Alex. <clears throat> Yeah, no, siblings are 100% uh, okay, but uh, just to tack on to what Corey said, make sure that if you're dealing with a sibling, it's on a fair market value basis. You know, don't get some type of sweetheart deal from a sibling where if, you know, especially for real estate, it's an easy one to identify if the property is worth 100 grand, buying it for 50, you know, could cause an issue for the fact that your personal relationship with someone facilitated a otherwise non-market sustainable deal, if that makes sense. Um, but I think people kind of get what I'm saying is that, you know, you can definitely deal with these people. You can lend them money. You can buy assets from them. Um, you know, as far as siblings, cousins, aunts, uncles, things like that, you just need to make sure that you know you're you're dealing on a relatively fair market value basis. A little discount's probably okay, but you know, paying half off for something, uh, I would I would caution against. All right. The next question I see here: any additional restrictions for an inherited IRA versus a normal IRA that isn't inherited? The only additional consideration I would say that you should make is that an inherited IRA is likely going to have required minimum distributions associated with it. So having a long-term hold strategy for any types of assets may not be in your best interest because you ultimately will need to liquidate and dilute that account uh, within a time frame uh, set by uh, typically the, the precedent of when that decedent passed away and, and what their uh, distribution timetable was at that point. Alex, any further input for that answer or question? Yeah, it actually changed uh, two years ago. So if you received an inherited IRA, 
and the person died within the last two years, then you're required, you have three options, um, which again would go right along with what Corey said, but just to add a little bit of uh, context to that, if the person died in the last two years, again, if they died prior to 2020, this wouldn't apply, but you have to um, distribute the account fully within 10 years. You don't have to take any distributions for 10 years, or you can take you know, equal payments over 10 years. But if you're invested in something that's less than liquid, i.e. real estate, you know, it makes it really hard to invest in kind of long-term uh, investments. Granted, 10 years is a pretty good runway. So if you wanted to maybe invest in a few deals and then just make sure that you liquidate and distribute the account by the 10th year, that's okay. Um, but the uh, the stretch IRA or the taking distributions based on the decedent's life expectancy and combined with yours uh, is something that went away a few years ago. So just be aware of that. What Corey said, 100% holds holds water uh, to that. Uh, you know, just with the with the inherent required minimum distribution of uh, beneficiary IRAs, it um, just makes things a little bit tougher for self direction in general. All right, thank you, Alex. And the next question here, um, I'm considering moving my HSA to a self-directed account, which could be a trust or LLC. I'm interested in trading in digital assets like crypto. Do you know if the exchanges work with both types of entities? I am specifically familiar because I, I've worked on the client account management and the sales side of things uh, that the exchanges do allow for LLC investments and that LLC, as Alex described, the single member LLC, uh, would be perfectly fine. We've got a lot of clients that have invested that way over the past 16, 18 months. As far as a trust, I'm not so familiar. Alex, do you have input as if a trust funded by a retirement account and HSA would be allowed? Yeah, you could do a trust. Uh, I would, be, the, the whole benefit of using the LLC is that you can self-manage it. The trust, because a trustee is a fiduciary, you couldn't, um, you couldn't do that. So, uh, you know, having the trust really wouldn't be effective because you would have to have the third party interface, you know, a third party person interface with that for you. So yeah, the LLC would definitely work, but um, yeah, that's just kind of my take on it. All right, thank you. Uh, next question, can IRA partner with a person who is putting in cash or should it only be IRA to IRA partnership? Yes, an IRA can partner with an individual putting in cash or another retirement account putting in cash for that matter. Um, I will actually be covering that specifically on July 19th on a webinar with my colleague Larissa Green. Uh, again, that webinar will be how to partner with an IRA or non-IRA members for investment transactions. Uh, the next one, sorry, I'm just going to proofread it real quick. I think you answered this, but what if my brother slash sibling is the partner and therefore not prohibited to work with? Now he then secures a multi-residential or single family dwelling. Could he then lease or rent to my child since it's not my building? Sorry, since it's not my building, but his. Um, Alex, that's a little bit of a nuance. If you're partnered on that building in any shape or form with your retirement account, then it would be disqualified is that the correct yeah. understanding and context of that you question? You don't get to delineate the ownership. Let's say it's a quadplex and you own it 50-50. You can't say, oh, well, he owns those two units of the quadplex because it's all on one deed. Um, you, you couldn't necessarily do that. So, um, yeah, I, I would shy away from that. Yeah, that's exactly what I was trying to articulate. A little bit more clear words from you, Alex, on that one. Um, can I buy a property for rent in Mexico? Uh, can I use my IRA to buy properties in Mexico? Uh, the answer for that question in any international retirement account investments is pretty much consistent in that the U.S. retirement system and the IRS does not prohibit any of those types of investments. It would be on Mexico side or any international uh, country that you intend to invest into to make sure that they allow the investment of a U.S.-based retirement account. Uh, we've had clients in the past, uh, myself as an account manager, I've dealt with clients looking to buy in multiple different countries in South America, and it's a case-by-case -case basis if that country will allow a U.S.-based retirement account uh, to make an investment in their jurisdiction, region, area. Uh, so you would want to check in this case in Mexico. I've had other clients ask about other countries, both in Europe, in North America, South America. It's a case-by-case -case based on where you're looking to invest, not necessarily what you're investing from. Yeah, and the the, the answer generally is yes. There's, there's Central and South America are relatively investor-friendly. 
Um, you know, it's uh, there, there might be some additional hoops you have to jump through. Um, some of them don't allow the IRA to own the property directly. You have to form a corporation in that country that the IRA owns. And then the, um, the, 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 the corporation owns the real estate. So, you know, the, the answer is generally yes to go what Corey said is 100% right. You just might have to jump through some additional hoops. Uh, I know just from recollection, I have, I've dealt with, I've dealt with property purchases in Panama, um, Nicaragua, Belize, uh, uh, Costa Rica, Mexico, uh, Colombia. So it's just something to look at on a case by case basis. Um, I've never had, um, you know, a hard no. I've had some clients have some issues that were outside of just the fact that they did the investment, just kind of dealing with, um, you know, bureaucratic issues and the like. But, you know, in general, you can, but there's probably going to be a little bit more of a, you know, bureaucratic red tape that you have to sift through uh, when dealing internationally. All right, we've got two final questions to bring us home here. Can I pay advantage fees outside my IRA or do your fees need to come from the self-directed IRA? Uh, you can definitely pay fees outside of the IRA account on our application. We do by default collect a credit card. You can also elect to have funds uh, pulled from your account balance if you have a cash balance to pay your fees. That is a client discretionary item. Some clients choose to have all the fees due to Advanta come out of the balance in their account. Some clients choose to have it come out of their pocket. Uh, to that effect, we have no stance. It's kind of something to consult with your CPA, tax preparer, use your own personal judgment on how you'd like that handled. And then the final question we have here is what does the FBO stand for in the vesting of the account? Advanta IRA, FBO, John Smith. That acronym is for benefit of or uh, FBO for benefit of. So Advanta IRA for the benefit of John Smith account number XYZ. And with that, we are wrapped up for the webinar today. Thank you everyone who has been participating, had stayed through through the end. If you're watching the recording here live, uh, please feel free to reach out. Anyone can ask Alex or I for a copy of the slide deck. So if you're interested in that, we're happy to send you a PDF of today's presentation slide deck. You can ask us any questions. So feel free to reach out to either Alex or I. We'll be happy to help you however we can. And with that said, have a wonderful rest of your day. Alex, any final words for you? No, thanks for being with me, Corey, on today's webinar. It's always a uh, pleasure uh, to do these with you. So uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions, reach out, let us know. We're happy to get you taken care of.